today I'm talking about facilitating social interaction in myotonic dystrophy. Okay. Um, the, the disclosures, I have no known financial interests or relationships to disclose that are related to this presentation. And so I am going to start out by just kind of giving an overview of the importance of social connection um, and the benefits, uh, both physical and mental health benefits of uh, social connection, and then the illness experience and how all of this um, combines uh, for uh, individuals who are affected with myotonic dystrophy as well as their caregivers um, in in an effort to um, have a discussion about facilitating successful social uh, connections and activities um, with uh, your your partners your uh, your partners your siblings your loved ones your children um, and uh, those who are affected with myotonic dystrophy. Um, so we know that um, social connection is important. Um, it's central to our well-being. It fulfills our natural human need to belong to, to groups, whether that's to family, friends, um, but to have those connections. And it provides us with a sense of purpose um, and feelings of being supported and valued. Um, it helps us uh, stay interpersonally connected with others, um, and uh, which can um, or decrease our sense of loneliness. Um, it broadens our social network. It helps us meet new people. Uh, social connection is important because it uh, has the opportunity to positively impact our quality of life. Um, it provides us with opportunities to laugh, and it also provides um, or offers the partner, the parent, the caregiver a break um, and a time to relax. And there are also health benefits to social connection. So there are mental health benefits of social connection. Um, of being socially connected. And so individuals who, who have interpersonal interactions and um, engage in activities and engage in discussions um, or just being around others are shown to have improved mental health. And that can look like lower rates of depression and anxiety. Um, they can have a, a lower or a a lower perceived level of stress. So their level of stress may be um, similar to other people in the family, but um, we know that uh, if, if there's communication and there's activities and, and they're engaging with others, um, they may perceive their stress, stress level to be lower than, than it actually is because they have um, a support system to help them manage that. Um, there is uh, there's research to show that there's increased levels of happiness uh, among those who are socially active. Um, there's an increased sense of self-worth and confidence. So that's uh, the the belief, um, self-esteem, and how you feel about yourself. Um, and then also I would say self-efficacy, so that belief that you um, can really do the things that, uh, that you think you can do. Um, there, we have greater empathy for others when we are socially connected. Um, that's that uh, opportunity to sit with somebody else to understand um, what, uh, what their experience may be and to put ourselves in their shoes and I, it's hard to do that if you're trying to do that via um, if you're not trying to do it at all or you're, or you're sitting at your house by yourself um, but we have opportunities to do that when we're when we engage with others and that can be in in um, you know in person 
but there's also some opportunities to improve our empathy or have greater empathy for others if we're if we're connected um, socially, and that could be through social media, um, texting, uh, having conversations on the phone. Um, it's been shown that. Uh, people who are socially connected have better emotional regulation, so they're, they have um, better a better skill set or more more tools in their toolbox for um, for regulating their emotions um, in terms of how they that kind of up and down and not uh, not having flip out moments um, for no reason. Um, sometimes our peers tend to keep us in line um, with that and not allow us to have uh, meltdowns, if you will. Um, it's been shown that there's decreased, decreased risk of suicide for individuals who are socially connected. Um, and then we also have a wider range of coping skills to address the stress and to manage life changes. And that could look like um, life changes such as uh, divorce, moving house, death of a loved one. Um, and in the context of myotonic dystrophy, it could be loss of function, um, change in relationships, um, and just the onset of additional symptoms. So there's physical health benefits of social connection. And what we know is that um, through some research that was conducted in 2013 by Steve Cole, um, he reported that social isolation is associated with diseases that involve both upregulated immune function and downregulated immune function. Uh, and so he determined that by being socially connected, um, we are essentially aiding in boosting our immune system and having a better immune system, and that can contribute to decreased inflammation, um, decreased cardiovascular problems, um, lower blood pressure, and improved nutrition. And there was a landmark study of social connection and health conducted by a researcher named House and, and his colleagues, where they identified a lack of social connection to be greater detriment to health um, when compared to obesity, smoking, and high blood pressure. So, um, so he's saying that uh, it, people who did not have social connections or had less social connection um, had uh, more, more of a health risk uh, than those who were obese, those who smoked, and those who had chronic high blood pressure. And other researchers have reported that individuals who have strong social connections have increased likelihood of survival. Um, and so that is a study done by a Finnish group um, showing that the strong so social connections mitigated mortality and that um, feelings, and, and another group, um, I struggle with this last name, Helwerda, and all, and they're also another group out of Scandinavia, and they found that it wasn't just social connection um, alone, but it was um, feelings of loneliness um, rather than decreased social connection. Um, so if you had feelings of loneliness uh, that out, uh, outpaced your, your social connectedness, um, that you had an increased, of, uh, in, increased risk of mortality, and that was in men. Um, and then there's also, um, we also know that social connection creates a positive feedback loop of social, emotional, emotional and physical well-being. Um, so all very good reasons to, um, to keep up our interactions uh, with, with others and maintain our relationships um, with friends and family on a regular basis. So it's a staff. 
sorry, <laughs> um, it's established that social connection is beneficial to our health. And how do we apply what we know about social connection to others um, in DM? Uh, so first we need to identify DM symptoms and place them in the context of the affected person's illness experience. Um, and so we know that there are physical, emotional, and cognitive symptoms. And some of those physical symptoms um, you all know better than I do um, as caregivers, but they're, they're muscle weakness, it's myotonia, uh, it's possible falls, it's GI symptoms, it's fatigue, it's cardiac symptoms, sleep problems, respiratory symptoms. Um, and we also know that these symptoms um, change or um, their onset is different across the lifespan. So um, in an onset of CDM at birth, which is the zero, um, zero year, zero months, um, you know, you may have one set of, uh, one set of specific symptoms, uh, particularly related to um, respiratory function and fatigue, or, sorry, not fatigue, a respiratory function, maybe feeding difficulties, maybe clubfoot, um, things like that, of that nature, as well as cognitive issues. Um, and we tend to um, uh, understand them as a developmental set of symptoms um, if the onset is at birth or through childhood. Whereas adult symptoms, um, we tend to understand as degenerative symptoms, so so loss of function, um, and um, or or increased onset of depression symptoms or anxiety. Um, so any of those uh, just a change or onset. Uh, physical, emotional, and cognitive symptoms. And going back um, to really, uh, to talk about emotional symptoms, what well, we know those to be um, maybe uh, depressive symptoms or mood changes, increased anxiety, um, mood, lability, and emotion regulation. So that's Kind of that that up and down, hot and cold. I'm I'm happy. I'm sad. Um, or having outbursts of anger um, with the emotion regulation. Uh, possibly personality changes. Um, uh, some individuals um, display symptoms of apathy, or which is just not um, not not gaining uh, enjoyment out of the things. Sorry, that's anhedonia. Apathy is um, just this decreased motivation, and it kind of looks like they just don't care. Um, it can also include uh, anhedonia, which is um, not really getting the same type of enjoyment out of activities that they used to. Um, and that can be a symptom of depression. It can also go along with apathy. Um, and it can also go along with some of the cognitive changes that we see um, in NDM as, um, we're, we're, as, as people with DM are experiencing some of that loss of function. And then some of those cognitive changes would be executive function changes. So more difficulty paying attention, um, trouble with their working memory or their short-term memory. So it may look like you um, have to tell, you know, you have to repeat yourself more often than not. Um, difficulty shifting set. So um, that could look like perseverating on something um, continuously, it can also look like difficulty from going going from one um, activity to to the next, and it takes a long time in in terms of uh, making transitions, um, initiating behaviors, um, getting started uh, on a task, 
is also uh, a, a executive uh, skill that seems to be affected or, or, or impacted in some individuals with myotonic dystrophy. Planning and organizing, um, just kind of understanding uh, planning activities, getting themselves organized, understanding how much, uh, how much time they have uh, in, in the context of um, appointments or trying to be somewhere um, is another um, area where we see some deficits. Monitoring behaviors, um, so that also can go along with um, and just kind of this recognition of time and how much time we have um, to get things done. It can also uh, be associated with um, an inhibitory responses. So, um, you know, oftentimes if we're, if uh, somebody has a, an issue with inhibitory response or inhibition, they may say whatever the first thing is that comes out of their mouth, um, and it may be hurtful for others. Um, so it's kind of like monitoring, um, monitoring what we say, um, and then inhibiting that, that need or want to respond or want to say something, um, without kind of, uh, thinking of the greater the greater uh, context of the situation. Um, uh, organizing self and materials, um, again, can be an area where uh, individuals struggle. And then slow processing speed. Um, sometimes there can be a low IQ or intellectual delay. Um, and also impaired adaptive abilities. So how, you know, how some of these cognitive and emotional and physical uh, functions translate to um, the context of our everyday life and how we adapt to everyday life. And what's, what's tricky about um, DM is that it's, um, it's multi-systemic and that it can range from you know from birth with CDM to to adulthood um, with uh, you know everything in between um, childhood onset adult onset um, and so with those sometimes those symptoms are developmental at birth in children um, uh, and developmental also for childhood onset or juvenile onset um, and then as uh, as those as those children age, they may experience delays in um, those domains, and then it may plateau off, and then those symptoms they may start to have loss of function, additional loss of function. Um, whereas in adults, some of these symptoms um, don't appear until you know disease onset or much later. And then they look like a degenerative uh, process, particularly when it comes to cognition and executive function, um, things like that. Um, and again, so those symptoms may change or increase across the lifespan. Okay, so it's important to think about um, myotonic dystrophy um, in the context of the illness experience. And so I have this little cartoon here, um, and it's really like a biological, so, uh, psychological, and social impact model of living with DM. So, you know, there are cognitive and behavioral aspects to this, and so, and that can look like um, for for the individual who's affected, it can it can look like you know thoughts about their illness, um, thoughts about their illness behaviors, um, kind of what they learned prior and how that's changed, and how they feel about their skill set and how they feel about themselves. Um, it can be um, it can look like depression. Um, it can look like um, symptoms of anxiety, um, it can, uh, you know, manifest in, um, you know, just loss of function and behavior changes. Um, when we're talking about the physical 
um, I'm talking about the biomedical processes. So, you know, just the, the, the degenerative, um, symptoms, whether the, you know, the physical symptoms. So problems with respiratory, maybe the development of cataracts, um, you know, GI symptoms, um, just those, those physical processes that um, individuals uh, experience as part of their DM. Um, and then how their body responds to that, how it's conditioned to respond to that. Um, those, uh, those are the um, physical aspects of living with DM. And then there's the, the functional piece of it. And so that's having disability um, and uh, in the context of adaptive daily living um, activities. So that's the ADL. Um, and it also relates to, you know, sleeping, nutrition, exercise, you know, what are what are the functions that are getting in the way? What are they able to do? Um, can that be can that be changed um, with an intervention? Um, can you increase uh, some function in the context of loss of other physical function? Um, those are uh, specific aspects of the functional impact of um, the illness experience. There's the social and environmental um, uh, piece to having DM and that can look like, you know, how does how do these individuals um, interact, excuse me, interact and operate at school? What is their family life like? Um, do they have uh, social life? Do they have social support? Do they have, um, I, you know, I live in Utah, so spirituality, um, is very much a part of our larger culture and um, people find meaning in uh, within their spiritual community. Um, and so what are what are those social and environmental opportunities um, and how did they how do they interact with um, DM? And then there's the psychological component. And so that really is the emotional responses. Um, you know, those feelings of depression, feelings of anxiety. Um, you know, what, uh, what of those emotional responses are reinforced, um, as part of the illness experience? Um, and then what are, what are psychiatric comorbidities? And so those are, um, you know, diagnoses of a, or a psychological diagnosis that um, may be part of, uh, maybe part of the disease phenotype or the traits that are associated with DM, but they also may be um, a, 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 a diagnosis that goes along, um, <laughs> Sorry, a diagnosis that somebody has um, in addition um, to having DM, and um, it's so. I think in in some communities there is talk about the relationship between autism in the in the CDM population. Is it autism? Is it um, or is it part of the disease phenotype? And so, just kind of understanding what those traits are and what those uh, psychiatric uh, comorbid diagnoses are in the context of um, having having CDM or having DM. And so, you know, what is the impact of uh, myotonic dystrophy on social status and identity? So, how how a person with DM perceives themselves. Um, I think that's that's really important, and throughout the lifespan of the diagnosis, the diagnosis and disease progression, um, it's possible that how how they um, perceive themselves and how they identify um, with uh, certain how they identify with themselves, their disease, their family. Uh, 
can change over time um, with changes in their disease. So, you know, as um, in thinking about social status and identity, um, because these are important things, uh, social status is something that's important to identity develops. Um, we have we all have this ascribed social status so um, it's given to us regardless of our abilities and um, so somebody can be a wife and a mother and a daughter and a female and maybe 44 years old and Latina and these are all things that um, just are um, and they've been ascribed to them um, from a social context, um, and they, uh, the individual cannot necessarily change that. Um, but then there's um, a way of uh, identifying and understanding or perceiving ourselves and our identity through achieved social status, and that is gained through our efforts and our talents and our accomplishments. So again, this person with DM, this, this mother, wife, daughter, female, 44-year-old, Latina, um, can also have accomplished becoming a friend, becoming a colleague. Um, maybe she's an accountant or a professor. Um, she identifies as an athlete uh, because up until um, you know, up and up until some of her, the symptom onset or the diagnosis or the disease progression, um, she liked to walk several miles a day. Um, maybe she's written a book, so she's an author, and these are things that um, she has accomplished through um, her many efforts and her talents. Um, so again, um, having myotonic dystrophy contributes to our identity and how one thinks about oneself um, and who they are in the context of their social environment and in their relationships. Um, and then understanding how, you know, a diagnosis of, of DM that comes after someone has formed their identity um, can have can have an impact on that because if uh, if somebody perceives themselves um, and through their accomplishments has has uh, gained you know all of these social statuses if you will um, such as an author and an athlete and things like that they may have difficulty accepting a diagnosis of DM because what does that mean for them? Um, as they're, um, as they may be experiencing increased, um, decline in cognition or increased decline in, um, physical function so that, you know, now they can no longer engage in some of those activities that they used to, um, that can have an impact on their their identity um, you know when they their identity formation and and you know they identify as this and now they have to change because these certain things are changing or they perceive it as such um, and so uh, cognitive symptoms also may impact the acceptance of uh, DM and disability so it may be if people are experiencing um, more problems with uh, cognitive function and a decline in cognitive function, um, they they just may struggle with um, understanding uh, their understanding the disease, understanding the disability, and understanding how that um, impacts their identity. And so, factors that contribute to how much of an impact uh, having DM plays on identity. Um, for individuals could be watching others' um, experiences of living with DM and symptoms and change. Um, so oftentimes uh, individuals who are affected have have or no other individuals, uh, have family members or no other, uh, other individuals who are affected or have seen mothers and fathers um, Symptoms increase and experience decline, um, and that impacts 
um, how they perceive themselves and identify. Um, social support systems can impact um, identity development um, and uh, and changes. And so, you know, having having a close uh, Tight knit social support system, um, as well as a you know a wide social support system, can have a positive impact on how somebody um, perceives themselves in the context of uh, the diagnosis and the ongoing disease. Um, so, also you know a frame of reference. So, you know, does illness define you? Or does illness not define the, the individual? So just kind of um, understanding where you know where they are in the context of uh, identifying with with the illness. I, I have this. I'm I'm experiencing these symptoms, but I'm so much more than my diagnosis and my symptoms. Or this really defines me and um, and who I am, and that's important to me. And I want you to know, you know, what it's like for me um, to be a person with uh, myotonic dystrophy. Um, also, you know, increased resources, whether that's education, um, financial, or financial. Um, or economic uh, resources that can contribute to, you know, um, different uh, different interventions um, and opportunities uh, to be physically successful or cognitively successful, um, or lack of resources may impact um, how DM plays on identity. Uh, and then just symptom development and um, wa the waxing and waning, the the decline, um, time frame. So some some people have um, have a trajectory trajectory that's more serious um, than others, and some and others have a slow trajectory of decline. Others is much quicker. So those are all things um, that may impact um, identity in the context of DM. So, so with that background, um, how do we facilitate social interaction? Because that's really what what you want to know. Um, and I think this is kind of a little summary slide. Uh, this in the next one are summary slides of um, uh, certain certain areas that uh, to keep in mind um, to help facilitate uh, successful social interactions, activities, um, things like that for for yourself, um, for your loved one, um, for for you know whether it's your partner, your sibling, your child, um, somebody you're caring for uh, who has DM. So, you know, it's important to keep in mind the needs and expectation for social activity. And, um, and that is, you know, both caregivers and affected individuals have needs um, and expectations for social interactions and, and activities. And those can be aligned and they can be very different and they can, um, they can vary uh, and be vary uh, um, from experience to experience and from individual to individual, um, as well as uh, change over time. And so strategies um, for identifying um, strategies for successful inter social interactions um, may include identifying and understanding what some of the limitations are for individuals uh, affected by DM. So what are those, what are the limitations? What are the barriers um, to being social um, or engaging in social activities? Um, what, are, what are symptoms that are, are barriers um, or limitations to being social? 
um, or, you know, engaging in activities. And then, then again, expectations and how we communicate um, with each other, how we communicate our expectations, how we communicate our needs um, can also be um, limiting uh, of social interactions um, and can be barriers. So what are strategies for facilitating successful social interactions? Um, these are communication, planning, problem solving, goal setting, and flexibility. So needs and expectations. So it's normal, it's healthy, and it's okay for a caregiver, a partner, a parent, a sibling, um, to want to socially interact and engage in social activities with their loved one who has DM. Um, it's also um, it's also normal for um, an affected individual to uh, want to be social or to not want to be social. So, you know, both caregivers and affected individuals have needs. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to say it, it's reasonable um, to need to spend time with loved ones, uh, particularly if, you know, you, you developed a relationship with somebody um, long before the, the onset of the disease symptoms. So it's kind of like you have this one life and then as things, um, you know, and you, and you have your social, you have your social network and as disease sets in, um, where, you know, certain things start to change and certain symptoms may get in the way of some of those, um, of, of some of those interactions. And so um, just, I think it's important to just understand that it's, it's, it's reasonable. It's a reasonable want um, and need to spend time with loved ones. It's not selfish. There's health benefits that we talked about earlier um, to being socially connected and, and it's meaningful and it's important. And it is, um, so um, I just want to, let everyone know in case uh, you know you were thinking that uh, you know am I being am I being reasonable that I want to, that I want them to engage in social activities or that, I, that you know I'd like to go out to dinner with them or I'd like to um, go see a movie with them and I'm kind of tired of uh, sitting sitting at home on a Friday night when we used to go out or we used to dance or things like that. Um, so again, caregivers and affected in individuals have expectations, and that's normal, it's healthy, and it's okay. And so, you know, what we want to do is identify what's important to you um, as a caregiver, uh, and why is that important, and, and then communicate, you know, that to, um, to the affected individual, to the family, to the wider social network, you know, what's important and why. Um, and we do this um, in order to strategize and plan successful activities or opportunities. Um, and, you know, in, in the context of having, you know, having needs and expectations and understanding why they're important. Um, I think it's also uh, reasonable to expect for things to go awry or to, you know, to not go the way that you want them to. And when they do, um, it's, it's important that as caregivers, um, we communicate how the situation impacted you um, and how you feel about that. So, you know, and, and that could be as simple as saying, you know, I, I was really disappointed that, you know, we didn't get to the movies on Friday. I was looking forward to that. Um, but, um, I, you know, we'll do it, we'll do it again um, as planned or something like that. 
So in, in determining strategies to help facilitate um, successful social interactions. Uh, it's important that you choose activities together. Um, so as a caregiver and as, a, um, as an inf affected person, um, so that there's, there's buy-in to those to those activities um, and and then you know so so choosing something together identifying what you like to do whether that's something that you used to do um, or something that you would like to bring on now as symptoms change um, what would you like to do um, to be social um, to, uh, with your partner or your child or your sibling, um, you know, as a as a caregiver. So, you know, working with them to say, here's what's meaningful to me, and here's why it's important, and it, and and communicating that and naming why it's important and meaningful um, can really be helpful in that uh, in that social reciprocity that you have um, with them, and it can also um, be really helpful in getting getting that buy-in um, to to you know engage in those activities um, and and you know going back to what we talked about before when you know being social helps uh, contribute to developing empathy and so you know when something doesn't when something doesn't work out it's important to um, you know to be able to say man, I was really disappointed that we didn't get to, you know, go over to John and Joni's for pizza yesterday. Um, I was looking forward to that. I hope we can reschedule again um, next week because that is something um, that's, that's important to me and I like them and I like hanging out with them. They're fun. Um, and so, you know, thinking about, um, you know what activities you can do together um, choosing those activities being flexible uh, when like I said when things don't work out so you know maybe you missed maybe you missed the seven o'clock movie because it was too difficult to get out the door or somebody was experiencing um, myotonia or GI symptoms and you just didn't get moving like you thought you would um, maybe to get to that seven o'clock movie. So maybe, you know, in, in choosing an alternative um, and being flexible, maybe you, you know, take a drive instead or something else that um, allows, allows you to be together or allows you to be um, or go over to a friend's house or a daughter's house or something like that. Um, switching between a caregiver uh, and um, I have a P for patient, but I really don't, I don't like that term. So, you know, the partner um, or your child, you know, switching um, in terms of choosing what activities you want to do together, I think is really important. And I keep going back to that. But again, that contributes to, to buy-in um, and, you know, gets them uh, motivated. Uh, to want to do something um, so or can contribute to increased motivation um, and so uh, let's see and then you know I it, when when choosing activities I think it's uh, important to ask yourself like is this a reasonable activity that either you both can participate in or the affected individual can participate in um, and um, is it is it a reasonable activity that um, somebody with DM can participate in now um, while they're experiencing, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z symptoms? Or is this something that maybe we need to put off uh, until a, a different day? So maybe they're really fatigued in the afternoon and don't feel like going going out. Um, but you know, mid morning might be a better time. And so, can you either switch your activity or can you switch your time? Um, is is there something similar to, that you can do with someone while they're experiencing fatigue? Um, 
or is there an alternative, um, you know, rather than going out, maybe um, doing something at home together. So again, uh, you know, in order to facilitate successful social interactions or get people, uh, get individuals who are affected uh, with the M, as well as, you know, I mean, this would apply to uh, children, partner spouses, um, helping motivate them to do things uh, that um, maybe they want to do or maybe they want to put off for a day or maybe they don't want to do. Um, it is important to be communicative. Um, so communication is key. Um, identify those barriers. This is just a refresh slide. So identify barriers to participating. You know, what's getting in the way? Can we change things? Um, planning, problem solving, goal setting, and being flexible. So communication strategies um, that can be applied uh, to um, engage in successful social activities um, might look like um, early and frequent conversations about, um, about activities, about going out, um, you know, communication is really key. And sometimes, um, sometimes we, we keep things to ourselves. Sometimes we keep it all in our head and we've got, you know, our whole running calendar going of how the day is going to work. And, um, sometimes we forget to share that with people. And so I, taking the time to communicate and engage in conversations, um, you know, early enough that we might be able to have more than one conversation about it um, so that, you know, as we increase our frequency, we get used to the idea of like, oh, you know, these things are happening. It's important to be social. Um, it's important uh, when communicating to discuss those expectations and those needs and what you value. Um, and so, again, that goes back to that um, empathy piece. It goes back to being being and feeling socially connected with um, with your partner, child, um, sibling, whoever you're caring for. Um, also, having early and frequent conversations and discussing those expectations and those needs and your values um, in the context of uh, activities helps. Uh, helps to avoid surprises. Um, so you already know, you know, you already know that uh, this is something that's important. So somebody can't come out and say, okay, you can not, we've never talked about that. Or, you know, that doesn't seem like something that I'd like to do. Um, it, it helps you identify, you know, all of those expectations, the needs and your values. Um, as well as disappointment outside of the activity itself. So, and, and the reason why that's important is because when you, having conversations um, about missed opportunities or um, disappointment in, in the context of you know an activity not happening um i call operating in crisis mode and so if you're if you're operating in crisis mode um, and you've never had discussions about these types of things before um it usually doesn't end well for anybody and everybody's disappointed because our our emotions are heightened um you know we're the the exchanges with each other can become um, just uh, not necessarily they're not necessarily helpful. Um, they can be hurtful uh, when you operate in crisis mode. Um, there's limited problem solving that takes place um, because because of that heightened emotional experience. Um, oftentimes people are disappointed um, and it's difficult to to share um, it's difficult to share that disappointment um, without being without showing anger um, and and that can lead to hurt feelings and misunderstandings 
So that is, those are some of the, the reasons why uh, being communicative, having strategies in place um, are key to um, doing, communicating early, frequently, um, and understanding where you stand with each other about, you know, what your, what your needs and expectations are in terms of um, social interactions, activities, and planning activities. So communication um, is also important in the context of, you know, it, it, like I call this the I don't know response. Um, nobody likes to get an I don't know response. Um, it doesn't really tell you anything. You know, it, it, it comes in, um, you know, if there's not planning or forethought, it's like, well, what do you want to do today? I don't know. Um, we'll come up with some ideas. I always come up with the ideas, right? And so, so it's, there's disappointment there and it's setting up, um, a negative exchange of, uh, of, of emotions and information with each other that's not necessarily helpful. So again, you know, avoiding that I don't know um, can be done through, you know, just early and frequent discussions of what's important and what you need. Um, you know, ways to deal with an I don't know um, are you can ask for a reframe or a different response. So uh, in terms of communication, you know, we do this with the little kids all the time. So you might ask a question and they may say, I don't know. And um, so how could you ask the question differently so that it doesn't um, beget the I don't know response? Or, you know, you, you could say, you know, how could we, you know, how could you answer that differently? Um, do you, do you not know or do you not want to say? Um, so those are, you know, that's a communication, um, pitfall that I think is worth, um, knowing, uh, or being aware of so that, uh, you, you don't fall into that because it oftentimes leads, leads to different disappointment. Um, you know, I think it's, it's important for, um, your, your partners and your, your children and affected individuals with DM to understand that you're not a mind reader. So I don't know doesn't mean I don't, you know, that, that you're going to figure it out. Um, it means, you know, help me understand what's important to you in this moment. Um, and other ways that we can communicate um, in a more positive and proactive way are asking open-ended questions um, instead of giving yes-no options. Um, so you can, um, you know, I'm trying to think, um, you know, saying, do you want to go to the movies? And then you get the no or yes. Do, um, and you could ask the open-ended question of, you know, let's, let's go out. Where do you want to go? And then you get the I don't know response. So again, important to communicate early, um, frequently, often. So you kind of have a little quiver or a toolbox of uh, different uh, social activities that are, that are important to you and, and things that you'd like to try and engage in. Um, Another another strategy, communication strategy that uh, is possible, it could possibly work, um, is to pull from that list things that you've things that you've you know decided on together, um, you know, both from your list from from their list, um, and then give one or two options that that you already know work for both of you. Um, and so that sets you up for a positive uh, experience. Um, and also have a backup plan if life intervenes so that opportunity is not lost. And so that's that idea of, you know, having, having a list um, 
understanding that you know maybe maybe physical symptoms are getting in the way or you know maybe the weather's getting in the way and you know your partner is concerned about going outside because it's it's raining and or it's snowing and they're they don't want to fall so they don't necessarily want to go out um to dinner so you know an uh you know an alternative to that could be okay well we had planned to go out to dinner i just got home from work it's not you know you're nervous about going out why don't we order in so so having an alternative so that the opportunity is not lost and you can still engage um either with each other or with somebody else um you know, it, it could also include, you know, we're, we're staying in, we're ordering in, but now we're inviting over our children or now we're inviting, you know, the neighbors to come join us. So identifying barriers to social interaction is important. Um, and so there are physical barriers um, and those are your physical symptoms and they can be symptoms such as fatigue or weakness or GI problems or myotonia. Um, they can be loss of function. Um, so, you know, some of those physical symptoms, now it's just, it's too difficult um, to get to the favorite, our favorite restaurant because it's, it's on the second floor of this building. Um, and that's a disappointment that we've processed through and we have an alternative um, to, to address that physical barrier um, of, of both uh, location and loss of function. Um, I talked about this um, in terms of, you know, other physical barriers or environmental barriers. So, things, you know, stairs um, are an environmental barrier. Um, going into environments that are too loud, so it may be difficult um, for, for everyone to hear each other, it may be, you know, especially if there's a lot of echo or you're having to shout. Um, and so, you know, that may not be fun um, if, if you can't have some of that social reciprocity um, by being with each other. Um, it may be too busy and there, it may be overstimulating um, with you know, different things um, coming coming at you. So like a sensory overload. Um, and and so that may be um, a barrier to um, to being social. Um, so so finding finding an environment that um, that fits both both parties is is important. Um, there's weather related uh, barriers being social. Um, and, and there's activities that are no longer appropriate, um, or, you know, you just, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't take them on like you may have five years ago because you can't be successful in those activities. Um, and, you know, depending on where you are, what your physical symptoms are, you may just, um, you know, geographically, um, have limited suitable opportunities. So these are all um, barriers uh, that that you know you as a caregiver may encounter in um, trying to arrange uh, you know activities that you can do together and share. Um, and so some things to think about are you know can you accommodate for some of these physical barriers? And I think you know you know changing environments. Yes. Uh, waiting for the weather to pass. Yes. Um, if somebody is very fatigued or feeling weak, um, you know, maybe after having um, a rest for, you know, the evening, um, maybe they're feeling more up to it the next day or, you know, finding, finding a time in between, um, you know, feeling of fatigue when you know when you could when you could uh, do something together or get them somewhere for swim class or something um, that that would be healthy for them um, socially. Um, so it's it's important to kind of you know think think outside of the box when it comes to um, those barriers um, and how you can 
how you can accommodate them. Um, and, you know, sometimes the accommodation looks like this, sometimes it, it changes, sometimes it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, I would say that it's very um, situational uh, and, and sometimes maybe day to day or moment to moment. So other uh, barriers to social interaction are emotional and cognitive barriers. Um, so depression symptoms, um, they can look like feeling tired, uh, that, that apathy or feelings of uh, being apathetic, feeling apathetic. So that, you know, just unconcerned, unmotivated um, to participate in activities. Uh, a sense of anhedonia. So just, you know, no longer experiencing joy from activities that they once, uh, once did. And, you know, as, uh, as individuals with DM are experiencing, um, loss of function, and symptom change, it, it's, it's to be expected that, you know, they may have to change activities and maybe it's, it's no longer fun to go out um, walking around the neighborhood um, because they, they get overly tired or overly hot or, um, so that's, you know, they, they don't, they don't experience joy from that, um, yet maybe we keep pushing them to do something like that. Um, so, you know, it's important to, uh, you know, continue to ask and plan, um, so that you can reduce feelings of social, or, or sorry, reduce feelings of isolation as it's related to, you know, planning activities and, um, to help, uh, you know, decrease symptoms of depression or anxiety as it's related to, the, to activities. So understanding what some of those emotional um, barriers may be to engaging socially. Um, you know, then there's also, um, you know, in terms of anxiety feelings, uh, you know, fear of falling, um, fear of saying the wrong thing, uh, you know, with, with the s slower cognitive processing, um, maybe the sense that, you know, they're not thinking fast enough to keep up um, with a conversation, um, and so they're, you know, they're feeling left out or, or, or they're actually, you know, being left behind in the conversation because it's difficult to, to track it um, for them, given their slow processing speed, um, you know, or they, they can't maintain um, all of the details. So that's related to that working memory. Um, you know, it may be difficult to uh, eat or swallow, and so just kind of some fear around that. Um, it may be hard to hear. Um, affected individuals just may feel overwhelmed in that environment or be concerned about how others will perceive them. Um, so, you know, just understanding that, uh, you know, those are potential barriers um, to being successful socially when you have symptoms of anxiety. Um, and, and something that I'd like to point out are, you know, these emotional and cognitive symptoms are, are not physical symptoms. They're not, they're not tangible. They're not things that other people can see. Um, and so there's a real um, possibility that you know, people form perceptions of others um, just just based on what they visually can see. And, you know, if they're not um, physically disabled to the point where it's noticeable, um, you know, other others may form a, a perception um, of affected individuals that's not really congruent with who they are. Um, but or could be um, related to kind of how they're how they're um, interacting in the world related to having a sense of anxiety or things like that. Um, so, you know, and then there's personality changes that I think, um, you know, was one of the things that uh, was addressed, right? Like how to, how to have, um, how to engage in social activities in the context of, you know, personality um, symptoms 
uh, maybe the aggressive um, aggressive personality uh, and or apathy. So um, just understanding some of those underlying um, notions related to their emotional and cognitive experience and how that contributes to social interactions um, is important. Um, you know, there's, uh, and we talked about cognitive barriers earlier, but just to reiterate, those are, or are, or can be changes in thinking, changes in, you know, attention, processing speed, um, working memory, you know, uh, getting yourself initiated and starting activities, um, that set shifting. Um, so going from, you know, one mental activity to the next or actually um, engaging in the process of uh, going from one physical activity to the next um, can be can be a barrier. Um, and then just changes in peer relationships. So uh, throughout the disease course, it's possible that um, individuals across the lifespan can experience or will experience uh, changes in their peer, peer relationships. So uh, friends moving on because they're no longer interested in some of the same things um, that affected individuals are, or friends uh, moving, moving on um, in terms of physical development. Um, in, you know, in the context of a friendship where somebody has um, loss of function and physical decline. So there, there's a, you know, there's definitely possibilities of changes in peer relationships. Um, and identifying uh, changes in, you know, diagnoses and loss of function changes and so how how you view uh, how affected individuals view themselves um, in the context of uh, their self-esteem and and their self-efficacy so that belief that they can continue doing the same things that they've been doing or um, you know that they they have a sense that uh, they want to be engaged um, with with self and others and activities um, and then there's the grief process um, and so in in diseases like myotonic dystrophy and other neuromuscular disorders with a loss of function um, individuals can go through you know stages of grief with those losses of function and that can be both affected individuals and caregivers alike um, and so how we process those stages of grief are not linear um, you know so we can deny that these things are happening we can be angry about these things we can accept it you know related to this but in parallel, you know, maybe maybe we can do all of that related to some physical loss, a loss of physical function, but a loss of cognitive function, maybe we're still in denial, um, whereas we're in acceptance with loss of physical function. And so, you know, they, they, they operate in tandem, um, but not in unison. And um, they, they have a big impact to... Uh, impact on caregivers and individuals in in terms of uh, being a barrier to engaging socially. Um, and so what are some accommodations that can be made? Um, so uh, on on a caregiver side, right, you know, if, if things change or, um, you know, uh, an activity gets canceled or something, you know, I, I, I like to think like, don't take things personally or don't take things too personally. Um, uh, you know, it could be a cognitive uh, function symptom. You know, it could be, you know, working memory. Um, it's difficult. So you're going to have to repeat over and over again because maybe, maybe they forgot that, um, you know that you had planned on going going out to dinner, or maybe they forgot um, that it was so and so's birthday, and you were you were going over for drinks and and cake. Um, 
So, so don't, don't take that personally, um, but understand that, um, you know, some, some of the, the emotional and cognitive barriers are normal to the disease progression. Um, and, uh, another, another, um, way of accommodating for, you know, for caregivers is, you know, maybe taking initiative. Don't wait around to be disappointed. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, you, you want to do something, you have a history with your partner of always going to such and such a place on Friday night. Um, and you, and you have the expectation that they're they're going to plan it because they've always planned it, planned it. Um, but now you know things are changing a little bit. Um, don't don't wait around to see if they plan it. If it's something that's important to you, um, go ahead, take the initiative, plan the activity. Um, uh, you know, so that uh, so that helps with um, you know you not having the sense of disappointment. Um, it also helps uh, the affected individual because maybe taking initiative is one of the executive functions that um, is uh, is declining and they're struggling with. And so, kind of coming up with um, accommodations for each other. Um, is important um, as as the disease progresses, um, and then you know making alternative plans. Um, so, if uh, you know if if your partner or your child um, is too fatigued to to engage or to do something, um, you know you don't necessarily have to have to wait around um, and be disappointed. You know, uh, make alternative plans for yourself, um, and uh, you know, or make alternative plans for them for an activity that uh, they can be successful at in in the context of um, that moment or that time period. So, uh, careful planning is crucial to uh, successful social interactions, um, and these are it's just a reiteration of some of the things that um, I spoke of earlier. So, early planning, early intervention, um, you know, just kind of uh, engaging in those conversations about what's important to you, what's important to them. Um, engaging in them early, engaging in them often, um, so, it's so that you kind of have a go-to list and, and you have an alternative, um, uh, you know, not, and so that you're not operating in crisis mode. Um, and then identifying, you know, potential possibilities for social activities and interactions, um, you know, problem solving that early, um, and then coming, being flexible so, to, so that if it doesn't work out in the moment or that day, you know, you can, you can come up with an alternative um, and, uh, or you have, you know, something else in your toolbox and it, um, it helps you avoid being disappointed. It helps them avoid uh, feeling guilty or disappointed um, and it just uh, contributes to a more positive um, social interaction and social and emotional reciprocity and relationships um, with each other. Um, so uh, planning age appropriate um, and developmentally appropriate uh, activities is important. Um, and uh, you know, again, kind of identifying what uh, what some of those activities are, um, what some of the potential outcomes might be. You know, if you if you start an activity and it doesn't work out, um, you know, having having the, um, having a plan for for having an alternative plan for when it doesn't work out um, to avoid uh, disappointment, feelings of guilt, um, and just have some solutions for how to um, how do you go about um, navigating that that situation is important.
so, uh, you know, it's important um, to understand that planning is an iterative process. It may take many tries um, for for you for you as a as a you know a team as a couple as a caregiver um, as an affected. Um, it may take many tries for you to hone in. Um, you know what what some of these. Uh, social activities and interactions um, look like for you and how they may change over time. Um, it's developmental um, and it's a developmental process. So um, it's, uh, you know, developing social skills um, may be more difficult for children uh, with, with CDM or developmental delays. Um, than it is for, you know, adults uh, with DM um, to be social or, or have social skills, but um, losing social skills may be part of uh, their disease experience. Um, so we're just kind of recognizing that. Um, it's important to understand that social skills um, are learned behaviors and they're de dependent on the reciprocal relationships. Um, and that goes both for, uh, for children and, uh, and adults and how we engage with each other. Um, inclusive activities and environments are important uh, because they provide opportunities for children and adults uh, with developmental delay or disability or um, progressive disease symptoms uh, to learn from their peers and for adults to enhance their interpersonal skills and, and increase their social interaction. Um, and then additional ways that uh, you can plan for successful social interaction are, you know, plan with interests and personalities and physical and mental abilities in mind. Um, and, and plans should be beneficial to all parties. So choosing things that, you know, that you're both okay with and that work for everyone um, is important. Um, Providing genuine opportunities to participate so that um, the affected individual is not just off to the side um, and not able to participate. So, you know, um, that that could look like, um, you know, uh, maybe playing a video game or something where they actually can can engage in the activity versus um, swimming or some a physical activity that may be difficult for them. Um, so, you know, it's, it's important to provide genuine opportunities to participate so that they can engage in those interactions and activities. Um, you know, planning may require direct instruction or suggestions for activities um, for both children and adults um, with DM and perhaps parents, partners, caregivers, um, they may need gentle, additional gentle assistance. So, um, you know, just to get things started. So don't give up too easily or too quickly. Um, you know, you want to avoid creating the sense of learned helplessness that they can't ever, you know, engage in the process of uh, determining, you know, what to do with you or with others socially. And then goal setting, uh, I think, is important in, uh, in this. And so understand goal setting in the context of, uh, you know, designing activities or engaging in activities or suggesting them or planning for them is important. So, so you want to make your goals broad, um, your social activity goals broad enough so that you can be successful. Um, and uh, you want to be open to change so that, you know, if it didn't, if, if one activity didn't work out, um, you're, you're flexible and you're, you know, not disappointed, but you walk away, you, you change, you change activities and you walk away feeling that you had a positive um, 
experience. Um, you want to make short and long-term goals for um, social activities. So especially, you know, if it's been very difficult um, to, to get someone to engage. Um, and so, you know, kind of understanding, um, you know, what do we want to do this week? What do we want to do next month? Um, so, and then defining success. So, you know, participating in social activities once a week, is that successful? Once a month, um, you know, just kind of, but also being flexible and having an understanding of, you know, what is success? What does a successful social activity look like to you? What does it look like to them? And, and how can you achieve that? Um, Reevaluating those goals and success, success definitions um, with new information and um, symptom change um, or circumstantial changes is important. So again, you can go back and feel successful. Um, you know, that, uh, so I also think, um, you know, in terms of goal setting, it's important not to engage in this either or thinking or I have to, um, I have to do this or I should be doing this. Um, that's being too hard on yourself and it's too hard on others and it, and it sets you up for disappointment um, and a sense of failure. So, for example, when X doesn't, does not occur, um, there may be a negative impact and it sends a message to yourself and to others, um, you know, that you failed at that activity, which may um, lead to some internalization of that and also may um, lead you to not try that activity again. And so um, I think it's important not to do that. Um, I think it's important to identify at least one positive related uh, to every stage or attempt at a social activity. Um, so that way you always, you always feel successful and there's always forward movement um, and that creates momentum um, uh, for for success and additional opportunities to engage in and this activity or other activities when you create a positive experience. Um, you want to avoid comparing interactions or activities and circumstances to previous um, activities or circumstances or social interactions that you had with people. Um, you know, at, everything's changing. We all bring something different to the table at at every interaction and so to to constantly compare those um, to each other is not helpful um, and doesn't necessarily um, contribute to feelings of being successful. Just in summary, for facilitating successful social interactions and successful social activities, um, it's important to be flexible um and when you're adapting to change and you know the disease course of myotonic dystrophy is varied and it's changing um it's uh you know lower your expectations and um and you're always a success uh so you know identifying kind of what are those what are those wants and needs um and, you know, can they, you know, is the expectation too high or, or not? You know, how can you, how can you be successful in your social interactions and in your, and your, um, in getting your partner, uh, sibling, child to be socially active? Um, and then, you know, it's important to, to continually repeat, um, repeat, 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 because we do things differently each and every time. Um, and, you know, what might not work out this time may work out next time, which may contribute to further and future successes. Um, and try out different strategies because not everything works for everyone. Um, and circle back to some of those strategies because, you know, it may not work in, in this context, um, but it may work in a different context.